Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Have you picked up my latest book yet? Kijo, Japan's Most Notorious Female Criminals, is now out. If you want to hear about some of the horrifying, bizarre, and often confusing crimes that some of Japan's most notorious female criminals have committed, do check it out. It's available on Amazon right now. This week, we're looking at some strange, terrifying, and ultimately unfortunate encounters with the other side. To start, a group of friends like visiting ghost spots on their motorbikes and one day stop by a famous tunnel that's said to be haunted. They take a few photos and, when they get them developed, discover something horrifying in them. But that's not even the scary part of the story. Find out why in... 1 to the 14th power of 10. Did you know that humans can pass through walls? It's about a 1 to the 14th power of 10 possibility. Apparently, it's because the particles that make up our cells are permeable. I saw something about it while I was watching TV the other day, and it reminded me of something that happened about 15 years ago, which made me wonder if that incident had something to do with this. So, I decided to write it all down. I wasn't a member of a bike gang, but I did love bikes a lot, and on Saturday nights, I loved riding around with my friends. We also enjoyed visiting ghost spots at the same time. One Saturday, I visited a famous tunnel with a few of my friends. There was a cherry blossom tree by the entrance that had a sign. Those who climb this tree will be cursed. I assumed that some locals rode it because they were annoyed by all the youngsters constantly climbing it, but most people were still too scared to try anyway. Having said that, there was one guy who took his shirt off and climbed to the top of the tree. He's the protagonist of this story, a guy by the name of Yoshi. Yoshi was a bit of an ass who sniffed thinners and rode around on an outdated bike, so he was kind of the odd man out in our group. Everyone ignored him and took pictures of the tunnel and such. We didn't have phones then, so we took pictures with an instant camera and then the photographer said something odd. Huh? The film won't wind. Apparently, the camera broke after taking only three pictures. Hey, hey, did the ghosts break it or something? Everyone started screaming and then, bang, we heard a loud sound in the darkness. Ow, 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 ow. It seemed Yoshi had fallen from the cherry blossom tree. Everyone burst out laughing and then we all made our ways home. A week later, The guy with the camera said there was a slight problem. He'd developed the three photos taken at the tunnel, but there was something terrifying in the photos. I asked him to come around and show me the photos, and when he did, I was shocked. The ground by the tunnel was covered in countless skulls. There were rumours that numerous Korean labourers had died making that tunnel, and it became famous after a magazine called Goro, ran an article showing a photo with two beams of light coming from the exit. I'd never heard anything about skulls being photographed by the tunnel, though. I was terrified by the sight of thousands of them, and then the phone suddenly rang. I had an accident. Can you come and get me? It just happened to be from one of the guys who had gone to the tunnel with us. As I was getting ready to go and get him, The phone rang again. I'm sorry, come and pick me up. I had an accident and my bike's wrecked. It was from another friend who had gone to the tunnel with us. Then the phone rang again. My bike's not working. All three calls were from guys who had gone to the tunnel with us. We didn't find it all that scary at the time, so we decided to get all three of them at once. But then... On the way to pick up the first caller, I crashed. The clutch wire that I'd replaced just the day before snapped. It was a bit of a bad omen. 
We all met up back at my place and everyone who had crashed said it happened in an unnatural way. When we showed them the photos of the skulls, they were all terrified. Hey, these accidents were no coincidence. It's a goddamn curse. We need to go and see the old lady, one of them said. The old lady was a famous spirit medium in the area. She lived in a temple, and apparently she could answer people's problems before they even told them to her. It cost 5,000 yen to see her. The three guys who had accidents all decided they would visit her, if only to have her get rid of the creepy photo. She lived in the countryside, but we knew we were in the right place immediately, thanks to all the people waiting to see her. We waited about two hours before we finally got into the temple, and we found the old woman sitting in a room as numerous people came to see her to discuss their problems. Shockingly, she was answering all their questions despite how many people were there. But the thing was, nobody was saying anything. Nobody was talking, and yet she was even bringing up the names of people involved in their problems. It seemed she was also doing divorce counselling. The people around her could hear names, but they didn't understand the details of what was happening, so privacy was maintained. Was that old lady for real? I thought, and the moment I did, she turned to me and clucked her tongue. You fools! Why did you bring something so dangerous here? You shouldn't be undertaking tests of courage so easily, you know? She didn't have any assistance. We didn't have an appointment. We didn't say a thing. And yet, she understood everything. Listen very carefully. I'm going to write you a charm, she said. Take it and head to a river with all eight of you who went to the tunnel, and then wash it away along with the skulls. Absolutely do not look behind you. You hear me? Leave the 5,000 yen and then get out of my sight. She wrote some strange letters like Sanskrit on the back of a leaflet and then gave it to us. We put the 5,000 yen down on the table and then left without saying a word, as though we'd just been cornered by a fox. She's gotta be a fake, right? But the skulls and the eight of us, she was spot on. And so, we had no choice but to trust her. We had no idea what was going on, but all we could do was gather all eight of us and go to the river. I explained the situation to the others who hadn't gone to see the old lady. Okay, you mustn't turn around, alright? Apparently something bad will happen if you do. And don't run, we're gonna be in trouble if you rush and trip. When I was done explaining, only one person didn't seem to be listening. Yoshi! Are you listening? Something real bad's gonna happen if you turn around, alright? He didn't say a thing, just laughed. Alright, I'm gonna wash these away now, okay? Once I do that, turn right. Don't turn around, okay? And no running. When I said that, I put the photo with the skulls and the leaflet with the Sanskrit into the water and it washed downriver. We all turned right at the same time and then slowly walked away. About 15 paces away, Yoshi started acting stupid. I climbed that cherry blossom tree and I'm fine, man. Why the hell would I be scared of some curse? Ha! He said and then turned around. Yoshi, quit it! It's dangerous! Stop! Yet he ignored all of us and turned around. Huh? What? What's that? Ah! Then he fell silent. Yoshi! Yoshi! What's wrong? Everyone stopped walking. Yoshi wasn't with us. Someone started running. Then everyone ran after them. 
We reached the car park, but Yoshi wasn't there. Hey, where's Yoshi? What happened to him? The sun was starting to set and it was getting dark. Everyone was too scared to go and look for him. Ah, I have an early start tomorrow, so I better get going. One by one, everyone disappeared until it was just me and the camera owner left. What now? Should we go look for him? Honestly, I'm scared. I can't. I wonder what he saw. We talked it over carefully and decided that we'd wait another 30 minutes, and if he didn't show up, then we'd leave. It was his fault for ignoring what the old lady had said, and ultimately, I just didn't feel like going to look for him. 30 minutes passed and there was no sign of Yoshi. There was little else we could do, so we went home. During lunch the following day, I called Yoshi's house from work. Surprisingly, he immediately answered. Yoshi! Sorry about yesterday. Are you okay? What are you talking about? Huh? I mean, how did you get home yesterday? How? On my bike. No, I know that, but... It was like we weren't having the same conversation. After work, the camera owner and I decided to go over to Yoshi's house and see what was going on. Yoshi, what happened yesterday at the river? We were worried about you. Well, I... (laughs) Yoshi, you're acting weird. Have you been sniffing things again? (laughs) Yoshi, what did you see yesterday? You saw something, right? Yoshi? I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. Not a thing. After that, he became impossible to talk to. I didn't know if he was high or not, but he just kept saying, I, and was drooling all over the place. We didn't know what to do. We weren't getting anywhere with him, so we decided to leave. When we got to the front door, we saw his bike. It was covered in a sheet when we got there, but it seemed the wind had blown it off. What is this? His bike was covered in scratches, and all the lights and blinkers were broken. There were dead branches sticking out everywhere and the mirrors were bent in the wrong direction. Where on earth had he gone, and what had he done to get it in this condition? There was no way he could have escaped unscathed when his bike looked like that. Yoshi? Hey, Yoshi? Ah. 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 He just screamed incoherently and didn't answer us. Before long, he quit his job and started seeing a psychiatrist. He was able to get on with his daily life, but he was no longer able to ride his bike. I knew it had to have something to do with that day, so I wanted to visit the old lady to ask her about it, but I wasn't able to. I couldn't, because I felt bad about disobeying what she told us. Next thing we knew, talking about Yoshi became a sort of taboo topic amongst us friends, and we became estranged from him. Then one day, I heard a strange rumour. It was a rumour about a tree in the fourth dimension. This tree was located deep in the mountains and heavily fenced off. When people contacted the local government about it, they denied such a tree existed. This tree was supposed to be just a regular tree, about... 50 years old, but it was also an entrance to the fourth dimension. If you threw an empty can or stone at it, it would disappear. You wouldn't be able to find them anywhere, meaning they no longer existed in this world. 
Apparently, the rumours originally started when an elderly couple went into the mountains to pick wild vegetables, and then the husband disappeared right in front of his wife's eyes. Things got crazy after that. All sorts of weirdos gathered nearby, and there was a big fuss about a child disappearing as well. But according to one of my weird friends who visited the fourth dimension tree, no matter what he threw at it, it never disappeared. That same friend went there just a week beforehand and claimed that the fence surrounding the tree had been torn down. Looking for a little excitement, I decided we should go and check it out right away. We got some friends together and just as we were about to leave, I heard a voice. I'm going too! Me too, me too! And what do you know, it was Yoshi. Who told him that we were going? We couldn't take him with us, he wasn't exactly in his right mind. But he was sitting on my bike and wouldn't get off. No, no, I'm going too! Apparently nobody had contacted him, so then how did he know? I couldn't get rid of him, so in the end I had to relent and take him with us. Just as my friend had said, the fence surrounding the tree had been torn down. I knew which tree it was immediately. It was surrounded by sacred rope, and sake had been placed on the ground by it. It doesn't look that impressive, one of my friends said, and then he threw a branch at it. It fell limply to the ground. So it was all fake then. Yet, for some reason, Yoshi grew restless when he saw this. No. No. You mustn't. You'll make him angry. You'll make the old man angry. He screamed and went into a rage. Even though it was 10pm and we were deep in the mountains, having to deal with the police would be a problem. Yoshi! Shut up! Be quiet! Why the hell did I bring someone like you here? God damn it! I regretted bringing him along, and as I looked at him kicking up a fuss, it made me angrier and angrier. I felt bad for the others, and so I suggested something as a joke. Why don't we push Yoshi into the tree? He's so damn noisy. Why don't we send him over to the fourth dimension? It was just a light joke, but... Oh, I like the sound of that. Let's get rid of this useless baggage. It's not like he has any reason to live anyway. Let's send him over. The commotion got louder, and someone even started chanting his name over and over. Yoshi, Yoshi, Yoshi. It wasn't like the fourth dimension was real, and I just wanted to scare him so he'd shut up. I got caught up in the moment and grabbed his arm. No! No, 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 no! The old man! The old man! I don't like him! I gripped his arm even tighter, angry that I couldn't understand what he was going on about. Another friend grabbed his other arm, and then we started dragging him towards the tree. The chant continued. Yoshi! 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 No! He kicked and flailed, trying to resist us. Someone started spinning their torch around and around, adding to the atmosphere. Yoshi, Yoshi, Yoshi! There was no going back now. When we were just one step away from the tree, I looked over at my friend. Then, we shoved Yoshi towards the tree. As I felt him leave my grip, the torch suddenly went out and everything went pitch black. I tripped over something and fell. Ow! What the hell? Why did you turn the torch off? Idiot! I didn't. It turned off by itself. Bang bang. Bang bang. After a few taps, the torch came back on. Huh? Where's Yoshi? He was gone? Yoshi was supposed to be right there between us, but he was gone. My friend who was holding his other arm had also tripped, 
and looked shocked. There's no way. Right? He's gotta be playing a joke on us. Hey Yoshi, quit screwing around. Get out of here. There were a few seconds before the light came back on, so he had to be hiding in a nearby bush or something. We all searched desperately for him. Hey! Yoshi! Get out here! That's enough! We're sorry! Come out! We shouldn't have done that! Sorry! Yoshi! Come on! Come out already! We started turning pale. Maybe he fell down a cliff or something while he was pranking us. This is your fault for bringing that dumbass here. I was filled with regret. Yoshi might have been seriously injured or maybe even dead. Shit. Shit. Yeah, it's my fault. Let's just go to Yoshi's house first and explain to his mother what happened. Then we'll go tell the police. I'll take responsibility for it. We all rushed over to Yoshi's house. Fifteen minutes down the mountain and an hour later on our bikes, we finally arrived. Ma'am? Ma'am? Something terrible happened to Yoshi! I'm sorry! His mother seemed surprised at our sudden loud appearance, but then she said something that immediately shut us up. Why are you here so late? If this is about Yoshihiki, then he fell out of the closet just before. He's been moaning about it. He's up on the second floor. Eh? What? We had no idea what was going on, but we went up to the second floor. And there, without a doubt, was Yoshi. Hey! Yoshi! Yoshi! How the hell did you get back here? Huh? For some reason, he was completely naked. He was covered in scratches, and drool trickled from his mouth. The old man. I... <laughs> you have no idea. The old man's angry. Yoshi, who the hell is this old man you keep talking about? Huh? Who is he? Come on, tell us already. I was nearly in tears as I grabbed and shook him. <laughs> Yoshi wouldn't answer us. According to his mother, about an hour earlier, she heard some loud noises coming from the second floor, and when she went to look, she found Yoshi naked and laughing. About an hour ago? That was when he went missing, right? I don't think there's much more I can do for him anymore. I hope you'll all stay friends with him, she said. There was nothing we could say in response. The following day, a Sunday, we went back to the fourth dimension tree again during the day. We were hoping we could maybe find a clue to help us uncover what really happened. But there was nothing around the tree. Then... One person found something. Hey, take a look at this. He was pointing at an open space towards the top of the tree, about 30 meters in the air. There were clothes hanging from it. Aren't they... Yoshi's? No doubt about it. They were the same clothes he had been wearing the day before. What the hell? No matter how much we thought about it, we couldn't come up with a good answer to explain why they were up there. Did Yoshi get sucked into the fourth dimension? Who was the old man? But no matter how much we tried, we couldn't explain it. Fifteen years have passed since then. Yoshi is no longer in a hospital, but he's now somewhere where we can't visit him. At the time, we felt like criminals, but if the odds are 1 to the 14th power of 10, then you might be able to pass through even a tree, right? And so, it wasn't a coincidence. 
but rather it was inevitable. That's what I keep telling myself anyway. There are villages all over Japan that are so remote, so isolated, that they have their own little cultural quirks and customs that outsiders would never really understand. In this next story, a young man is forced to return to his mother's hometown when he turns 20, although he's not really sure why. When the whole story finally begins to unravel, he discovers the horrifying truth behind his entire existence. Find out what in The Bad Thing. I have zero ability to see ghosts. Never experienced anything supernatural either. And so, I'm the type who cries about how scary something is while enjoying scary stories. Several years ago, I received a strange request from my friend A, a university student at the time. It was… yeah, I think it was right around the middle of summer. I want you to come back to my mother's family home with me, he said. But… I'm a guy. Are you okay with that? It seemed he really wanted to visit his mother's family home again having been there the previous year when he turned 20. But something had come up and his mother was unable to go, and because he didn't want to go all by himself, it came down to me, his friend since high school, to tag along with him. You sure are weird. Why would you take a friend to go back to your mother's family home? Well, it's not like I have anyone else. They all refused. So, that was that. A's mother's family home was located in a small village way out in the mountains, smack bang in the middle of the countryside. But it still had electricity, water, and even the internet. It was about 10 hours away by train, although most of that was waiting time. And so, as we were bored and waiting, he told me a story about what happened the year before. Apparently, his mother had told him the previous year that When he turned 20, he should really, really visit her hometown, but that was the last thing he wanted to do. I've seen the village myself, so I get it. It was really out in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing to do there. But still, his mother came from a rather well-off family, and so she wanted to show off her son who had just become an adult. As such, he was forced to go along. As he expected, there was nothing to do there. There wasn't any manga to read, there were no game centres nor even a PS2 at home to play. There were no convenience stores either, and the closest was two mountains away. That was the kind of place that village was. There weren't any visitors either, other than saying hello to his grandparents, so he was like, why am I even here? Tired of lying around at home doing nothing, he decided to go out for a walk to a shop in the nearby area. That was where it happened. He went into a sweet store, and a voice called out, We're closing! Leave! He was chased out, and there were no vending machines there either, so although he wanted to get a drink, he was unable to. A, of course, was annoyed that he was being treated like an outsider. He was so upset that he went to ask an old lady selling juice in front of the store about it. What the hell is wrong with this place? Why won't they sell me a drink? Did I do something wrong? He screamed. But the old lady wouldn't even look at him and turned her face away. Hey! He screamed. But then the old woman started screaming as well. Get Help me! It's him! Father! Then an old guy with white hair came out from the back of the store holding a wooden stick. Not a branch, but something like a wooden club. But he wasn't just threatening A, he actually brought the stick down to hit him. He screamed at him in the local dialect and then A ran away. Or he tried to. 
because the residents who heard the commotion suddenly ran over and surrounded him. He pushed through up the mountain path, wondering to himself, why? Did he do something wrong? He ran all the way back home. Mom, what the hell is wrong with this place? The people here are crazy, he screamed, even though there was a guest over at the time. But his mother didn't say a word and just looked down at the ground. Oh, my, you've grown. Do you remember me by any chance? A priest sitting across from his mother said to him, Thinking they must have met when he was just a child, A replied that, yes, he did, even though he really didn't. Then he turned to his mother and explained what had just happened again. So you don't remember? You don't remember, huh? I see. If you don't remember, then what should we do? The priest then said, turning to A's mother. His mother looked troubled and was unable to reply. After a brief silence, the priest then spoke again. Let me tell you a story. The story started from just after A's birth. His mother had returned to her family home shortly after the birth to relax, recuperate, and because her parents also hoped that she would raise A amongst nature. A's father was living away from the family at the time due to work. The house was in a good location, so every day people visited them incessantly to see A, and nobody was able to relax. But still, A's grandparents were proud of their daughter and new grandchild, so they greeted all their neighbours happily when they came over to see them. Then one day, a famous monk, the previous chief priest's master, for sake of simplicity I'll just call him the master, who was well acquainted with A's grandparents came over to see him and give his blessings. As A's mother was holding him, the master walked over and looked down at his face. Then somebody screamed something and appeared to mutter a curse towards the master. Of course, A's mother didn't think that it was him, he was just a newborn baby in her arms. But the cursing didn't stop. At that moment, the master's face twisted into an expression of fierce anger, and everyone in the room realised that the voice was actually coming from the baby. A's mother stood there frozen, unable to comprehend what was going on, while sweat dripped from the master like a waterfall. It's Nani Nani! Someone screamed, and then the house went into an uproar. The visitors there ran outside, not even stopping to get their shoes. That night, A's mother, grandparents and the master discussed what to do with pale faces and they decided they should summon the chief priest from a nearby village. The whole time, villagers surrounded the house, which was more like a mansion, really, with torches, ready to burn it down. But scariest of all, apparently A's mother and grandparents were also talking about how they might kill him. No, you absolutely must not, the master screamed squashing the idea immediately. Let's just do what we can first. And so, the master took A into his care and started raising him at the temple. I didn't hear the full details, but apparently it was a thing where he was raised at three or four different temples, with each taking him in turn. Time passed and nothing major happened, so until he was 12, he lived at these temples, but considering how old the master was, it was around this time that he passed away. It was thanks to the master that the other temples agreed to take A in, but once he was gone, things became more of a problem, and because they were unable to work something out, he was finally sent back to live with his parents. Apparently, the monks said that it was terribly irresponsible of them, but at the same time, there was nothing they could do for him either. As for what the villagers called him, 
Apparently it was a word in their dialect that meant something not good. It wasn't like it was a set term or anything, but it was something along those lines. And it was a word that should never be said. A referred to it just as that or that thing. He had, apparently, been possessed. After listening to one of the chief priests explain the situation, A was confused. But once he calmed down, he asked him a question. Why do I have to come back here when I turn 20? Apparently, it was the master's final wish before he died. If the thing doesn't appear by the time he's 20, then he has been cured. Nobody knew how he came to that conclusion. But if that thing appears again, then you must crush his skull with a stone and end his life. That's apparently how bad the situation was. Having said all that, the priest then looked at A and smiled. But it's all fine now, so don't worry. When we arrived at the village, we didn't head to his mother's family home, but rather straight to a temple. It was very clearly old and run down, but for some reason, there were stone balls lined up along the fence. And it wasn't just one or two, there were dozens of them. Not only that, but every single one of them had been split in two, or shattered. We were just in time to see the chief priest returning on his beloved cub. He took his helmet off and smiled when he saw us, then motioned for us to come over. Um, sir, what are all those balls? Even after we passed through the gate and walked through the temple grounds, there were broken stone balls everywhere. I couldn't help but ask. Ah, those are Bon. That thing tried to kill A, so these acted as substitutes instead. Bon referred to A, meaning that the thing that possessed him then tried to kill those stones instead of him. There simply weren't enough substitutes for him, so the master even used my beloved cub at one point. It destroyed everything, the chief priest said with a smile. Then his face suddenly turned serious. The master, yes. Then he hurried inside and came back holding a package. This is from him. When A opened it, inside was a lacquered Buddhist mortuary tablet that had been split in two. Why did he go this far for me? A muttered, looking at the unnatural split that appeared to have been done with incredible force. Nobody said anything for a while, and as the sun began to set, A left the sake and souvenirs he brought with him, and we left. Take care of yourself, the chief priest said as he saw us off, and then we made our way towards A's mother's family home. So, what's so bad about this thing then? I asked A on the way back. Well, it brings people misfortune. Not just the person possessed, but all those around them as well. I don't really know all the details, but apparently it used to happen a lot in the past. Just having it around was unlucky. Numerous people got sick, died, families were destroyed, crops failed, livestock died, etc. That's apparently why they had to kill it. Not only did they have to kill whoever was possessed, it was apparently done in a way that even just hearing about it would make you lose your appetite. I mean... They wouldn't do that these days, would they? I asked. A just laughed. I later heard there were various reasons as to why that thing no longer possessed A. But according to the master's final words, those substitutes had been indispensable. And they knew that when they suddenly stopped breaking one day that A was going to be just fine. Our final story for this week sees us heading into another village with another unique custom. For two weeks during a certain month of the year, 
nobody is allowed to enter the mountains near the village. It's said that the local Kamisama descends upon them during this time, but what happens when some family from out of town come to visit during this brief two-week period? Nothing good, of course. Find out why in Saegami-san. When I was a child, I lived deep in the countryside. It was a quiet, rural area, surrounded by mountains. And, in our village, we had a rule that, during a certain month of the year, you couldn't go into the mountains for the week before or after the full moon. The children of the village were told it was because the Kami summer came down to the mountain during this period. During this time, we would hold a festival in front of a shrine dedicated to a Kami summer we called Saegami-san, and stretch sacred rope along the road from the mountain to the village. While this festival was taking place, neither children nor adults could go up the mountain. We had been strictly warned since we were young, and it wasn't exactly a fun time to be up in the mountains anyway, so there wasn't anyone who was prepared to get yelled at just to go up there. But still, as children are wont to do, there were still one or two kids who would act stupid and try to go up there every few years or so. Those who were found hiding in the mountains would be told off, their heads shaved, forced to miss school and then they had to spend a week undergoing training in a shrine the next village over. And so, when the children in the village saw this, they were too scared to go up into the mountains during this time. When the generations changed, there was always some fool who dared to try. Then people would see what happened and decide for themselves that it wasn't worth it. Then when people started to forget, the cycle would begin again. So up until this point, it might just sound like some weird countryside custom, but it all happened when I was in the sixth grade. It's not like I saw the thing myself and it itself was probably just a product of the village's customs and some mental confusion, not something occult or supernatural. But still, the fact remains that my cousin's little sister broke the village's rule and went mad. And then her older brother, feeling responsible for what happened, also lost it after. That year, my cousin's father was unable to take time off during the Obon season, so they took some time off at a different point and, as a family of four, returned to our family home. This was a time when people didn't usually visit the village, and that was where it all went wrong. Children in the village were constantly and strictly reminded that they must never enter the mountains during this time of year. But my cousins didn't normally visit at this time, so they didn't know about it. My grandparents had mentioned it to them once, but because they were city kids, they no doubt didn't really understand what it meant. Maybe they didn't understand, or maybe they just took it to be a stupid superstition. There's no way for us to know now. If it had been during the summer holidays as usual, then we would have been able to play because we wouldn't be at school, but sadly, it was a weekday, so all the village kids were busy at school. We played with them once school was out, but in the morning, they only had each other to hang out with. Our grandparents kept an eye on them to make sure they didn't go into the mountains, but of course, they couldn't watch them constantly. For the first three days, they seemed to obey our grandparents' commands. Or at least, so everyone thought. The problem started on the fourth day after they arrived in the village. We were right in the middle of the Saegami-san festival, and that day just happened to be the full moon. While we were at school in the morning, my cousin S took his younger sister Waiko with him as they snuck away from our grandparents, and they went up into the mountain. He told our grandmother that they were just going to play by the river, but when we finished school at noon that day, it was a Saturday, and went to the river to find them, they weren't there. At first, I thought that maybe they had an accident, so I went over to ask my friend Dee's aunt about it. 
She always let us park our bikes at her place when we played by the river, but she said she hadn't seen them at all that day. And so, we decided to go looking for them. My friend T found S's bike in the shade of a tree by the entrance to the mountain. I figured they must have been hiding somewhere on the mountain and I wanted to chase after them, but I had always been told never to go up there. So, I decided to go and tell my grandfather first. Seriously? He said after I got back and told him. Normally, he was so calm and it was the first time I'd ever seen him get so worked up. When my grandmother heard, all the blood drained from her face. My uncle, S's father, also went pale. But my aunt, S's mother, didn't seem to understand what was going on. My grandfather got on the phone to someone right away. After that was a mess. The village youth group gathered at the shrine dedicated to the local Kamisama, Sayagami-san, while the elders also gathered to discuss what to do. I remembered thinking that even though there was a rule not to go into the mountains during this time, it was still incredibly odd that there was such a reaction to it. Then, as the youth group was gathered at the entrance to the mountain, S suddenly came running down the mountain path with a terrifying expression on his face, acting like something was chasing him. When my grandfather saw him, he grabbed some of the sake and salt that had been left out for Sayagami-san and poured them over his own head and in his mouth, and then he grabbed S and did the same to him. Then they made him swish both around in his mouth. After that, S vomited on the spot. When he was done, my grandfather pulled him away. As they passed through the sacred rope, the village elders poured both sake and salt over the both of them again. S was then taken away by the leader of the youth group, and from what I later heard, was escorted to a shrine in the neighbouring village. As for S's sister, Waiko, for some reason, nobody went up the mountain to look for her. When I asked my father about it, he just said that, Today is a bad day for it, and sadly shook his head. I still remember my aunt screaming for them to go and find her daughter, but my uncle did his best to calm her down with a sad look on his face. In the end, she was found four days later in a shrine halfway up the mountain. I later heard that she had already lost it by then and was no longer herself. And, for some reason, she was sent to a shrine in the neighbouring village just like her brother, rather than a hospital. I later heard there was a big dispute amongst the village elders at the same time as well. So, Waiko is apparently still at that same shrine. On the surface, she looks like a live-in shrine maiden, but in reality, she pretty much lives in a prison because they can't mentally rehabilitate her. This isn't something we're allowed to talk about in our family, so I don't know any further details than that. Sorry. I was only able to discover that much by getting my father drunk first. As for S, he was in a state of shock and confusion at first, but he recovered and returned to normal life. My uncle stopped visiting the village after that, and so I never saw S again, but I heard that he took what happened to his sister pretty hard and lost it for a while, believing that it was his fault that his sister lost her mind. Apparently, he took his own life at 18 in front of the shrine where his sister was found. I had already moved out of the village to go to university by then, so I only heard about it when I returned home for my coming-of-age ceremony. A massive thank you and shout-out to this week's Kamitia members. Baked Beans, Nocturne, and Christina. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to pick up Kijo, Japan's Most Notorious Female Criminals, available on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin, 
for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kawabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe and I'll see you again next time for even more Kawabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.